Hey guys, we're live from First United Methodist Church in beautiful downtown Humboldt. Um, Katie's going to sing a couple songs that I requested, and I specifically requested them because of something I read in Job this week. Uh, and if you'll read the story of Job, you'll see that he was um, pretty much destroyed by Satan. God allowed him to take his children and his life and, and not his life, but his, his belongings, his riches, his, his house was gone, and he even was stricken with sores. And yet, Job says, though, yet though he slay me, yet I will praise him. So even though God brings trouble on us, and uh, I struggled with this, but the reality is that God is in charge, and he allows things to happen. So ultimately, everything is his responsibility so even though he allows these things to happen it's always to his greater purpose mm -hmm. it always is adding to the story he's writing down the road and in the beginning of Acts uh, we see that the disciples are, are waiting in the upper room they're terror-stricken they're afraid for their lives Jesus has just been crucified before their eyes uh, in a very unfair trial and they're afraid and they're waiting and then after the Holy Spirit comes and they have been empowered to speak, Peter in Acts 2 gives the sermon of his life. And in facing the, the fears, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, he stands up and preaches the greatest sermon he's ever preached because he now has no fear because he knows that yet though he slay me, God is, I will praise God in this storm. And I think it's, I think it's hard for us all to remember as believers especially that God isn't God doesn't just give you good 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 all the time you know That's right. um, sometimes he doesn't intervene you know for us to learn a lesson or for us to experience something to be able to share it with someone else um, and share our testimony so I think it's important for us to remember that if if you're going through a rough patch something good is going to come of it just keep pushing keep pushing forward keep praying keep keep your faith yeah so, so sometimes all you have to do is just keep breathing you pray to God and you keep breathing and that's all you have to do until you can come out the other side and here's something that I that flabbergasted me when I, I first learned this several years ago riches and wealth and health do not equal being righteous before God or being blessed by God so because you lose any of those does not mean God does not still love you and you cannot still be righteous before him. And I think about Dory, the fish in Finding Nemo, where yeah. she's like, just keep swimming. Yes, just keep swimming. exactly. And so sometimes you have to just keep praying. You have to just keep breathing. Just keep, keep swimming. keeping on. Channel, yeah. channel your inner Dory. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, so here's Katie singing. Here I am singing. <laughs> I was sure by now would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen, and it's still rain. As the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. Your mercy falls. I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. And I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands for you are who you are. No matter where I am, and every tear I cry, you hold in your hand. My side, and though my heart is torn, I remember when I stumbled in the wind, you heard my cry to you, and you raised me up again. My strength is almost gone. How can I carry on if I can't find you? And as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain. I'm with you. And as your 
never done this song before. I feel like I say that every month. I feel like I say There's that every month. I'm yeah. always like, I've never sang this before. There's always one. Mount 
come, you won't climb up coming after me. again no we couldn't earn it no we don't deserve it but still he gives himself away oh the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God Thank you, Katie. Say bye to Katie. Bye. All right, let's see if I can do this. Still being on camera. Yay, I did it. So, that song always moves me to tears, just thinking about God's love for us. It is overwhelming. It is reckless. He leaves the 99 and comes after the one. And... You know, we started in Genesis, and we read through Exodus, and now we're in Acts. And the whole point of all of this is that God loves us, and he desires us to come know him, to have a relationship with him, to understand his saving grace for us. And um, that it's just overwhelming to me thinking about that. So, moving on. We were in the middle of Acts 2 when we stopped last time. It's hard to believe it's been at least a month, if not longer. Um, so looking back quickly in Acts 1, this is when the disciples were waiting in the upper room. Jesus had appeared to them and walked with them and given them some instruction and talked to them about things. And they told them to go and wait in the upper room until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they said, once that happened, then you will be my witnesses. And to be a witness is just to tell somebody what you've seen. It, we, can, we all have a responsibility to be witnesses in our own lives, wherever that may be. Um, maybe it's just in your small circle, your home, your circle of friends, or, or maybe you've been called to be a great evangelist or a great musician like Katie and give your witness through music. But in any case, we're all called to do that. So they were waiting in the upper room. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And began speaking in languages that everybody there understood. And this was the time of Pentecost. So in, the, in Genesis and Exodus, in Exodus uh, Pentecost was uh, a celebration, if you will. So Passover had happened. And, and Passover is foreshadowing uh, the death of Christ. And then when Pentecost came, it's the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a great celebration. The harvest was coming in. God had been good once more, and there was abundant food. And so this is their celebration. And it was the 50th day after Passover. Well, it's also the day that the Holy Spirit came and uh, baptized everybody. So there were a lot of people there from all different places, all different cultures. And they heard the disciples in their own tongue. Now, whether the miracle was that the disciples were speaking in languages they did not know or that the hearers heard in their language as if they had a translation device on their head. And that's something that we don't know, and it's really not important to the story, but what's important is that that miracle occurred. And so often we dismiss miracles in our lives. Miracles are still happening around us. You know that they are. Things that you can't explain, things that happen uh, 
in your life that you kind of go, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Why would that be? But they still happen. <clears throat> Miracles still happen, but we dismiss them. So a lot of people will say, well, I would believe in Jesus if this person was healed or if that person could walk or if that person could see. And these things happen then in front of these people and they still didn't believe. So that's not the answer. Faith is a gift from God and that's what we need to be praying for. All right, so moving on into chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has come upon them. Peter gives the sermon of his life. They are heckling, saying, you guys are just drunk. And Peter stands up and he defends them. And he says, no, it's too early in the day. We're not drunk. Let me explain to you. And he says, this was a prophecy in Joel. And he goes through and explains that. And then he finishes by saying, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, is that not what reckless love was just about? Everybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And he says, Jesus was a man accredited you by miracles, wonders, and signs, and yet he was still put to death before you. You still didn't believe. Um, he quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And this is David. This is the Old Testament. This is hundreds of years before Jesus. David is prophesying. I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Now, David died and was buried. And they could, and when Peter was saying this, when he was quoting this, he said, look, right there, that's where David is buried. But Jesus was not buried. And this is talking about him. His body will not see decay because he was resurrected. So beginning in verse 29, which is where we, where we left off, Peter goes on to say, I can tell you confidently that David was buried, and here's his tomb. But he was a prophet, and he knew that God had promised him on oath that one of David's descendants would sit on the throne, and this is the resurrection of the Messiah. God has raised Jesus to life, and we, Peter's talking about the ones that were there, are all witnesses to this. He is exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, which he poured out on them, and which he promised to us, because Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I will send a comforter to be with you. And that is comforter is here with us today, and we need only ask. A friend of mine, I saw her earlier this afternoon, and she was telling me that she had a really bad week last week, and she's got some serious health issues, uh, and, and not very little family left and she says she was so afraid and she cried out to God she says God help me I cannot get through this I cannot do this I am so afraid and she said she just felt like the spirit come over her and she was calm now nothing happened in her life her health was not suddenly restored she didn't suddenly have millions of friends and family and she wasn't uh, regaining her youth but she felt that peace that calm and she knew that God was with her. And that's all you have to do is ask, and God will answer that. Peter goes on, and he says in verse 38, Repent and be baptized. If you don't know repent, what repent means, it means to turn around. So if you're going down this street and you're doing things along the way, and you keep going down the street, you're going to keep doing those things. You're going to keep living that lifestyle. And at some point, you've got to turn around. You've got to stop. You've got to make the decision. You're going to keep going down this, this path and keep doing these things, or you're going to turn around and follow God. And so repent is to turn around and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And that's the other thing is you have to accept that you have sinned. We have all sinned. There's not one of us alive that has not sinned. It is our inheritance from Adam and Eve. It is the nature of man. <clears throat> Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise, oh, y'all, listen, the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord will call. That's not just them there. That's us now. That's looking down through the ages to us. God is for us. 
with many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them. And I'm pleading with you now. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation and tell me we're not living in corrupt times. All you have to do is look at the news and you see hatred and anger and violence. And yet things are not right. There are a lot of things wrong. And people are doing going about things in a way that's not healthy, that's not considering uh, other people, that's violent and angry. But the answer is not violence and hatred. That's not the way to go. We are living in a corrupt, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Don't fall prey to that. Don't fall into that violence and anger and hatred. And it says those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the sermon of Peter's life. This is 3,000 men. Now remember in that time they didn't count the women and the children. So who knows how many women and children were there with him that also heard and were also baptized, that also received this message and repented and became Christians. After that, in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. The apostles' teaching, to fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. These are four things that the church is founded on that we still need to continue today in whatever form we have to because this time of COVID is just really weird. But we have to do the best we can to continue this. The apostles' teaching is, is the teaching of respected Bible leaders, your pastor, maybe even a televangelist on TV, but be cautious in listening to them. What is their true message? Read the Bible for yourselves, y'all. Read it for yourselves. And if you don't understand it, read it anyway and ask God to explain it. And he will. I promise you he will. Fellowship. Being with like-minded believers. It's, it's not good to, if you've quit smoking and you've quit drinking and you're not out carousing and causing trouble, it's not good to go hang out with those people because you're going to be smoking and drinking and carousing until all hours. That's what those people do. You've got to find yourself new friends, like-minded friends, like-minded believers. The breaking of bread, whether that is a communion meal in the church or it is getting together for a meal with friends, and there are still ways to do that now in COVID. You can meet outside. Outside is your friend. You can sit outside six feet apart. You can have a meal together. You can talk with each other, and you don't have to have a huge group that's close and partying. You can still break bread, have fellowship with like-minded believers. And to prayer, and this is the other thing, you, you need to pray. Prayer is the answer. Prayer is the answer to everything. You need to pray to God for repentance and that he will forgive your sins and that he will accept you and be your savior. You need to pray for your church, for your community, for your children, for your family, your friends. You need to be praying all day, every day. And that doesn't mean you have to sit down like the Pharisees and, and beat your head against the wall. But you can give up breath, prayer, breath prayers all through the day. Set aside some specific times for prayer when you first get up, before you go to bed. Uh, somebody said, and this is controversial with some people, that you pray before you go to bed, you fall asleep while you're praying. Well, that's sacrilegious. That's terrible. That's awful. I don't know. I, I kind of feel like I'm talking with my best friend. I am fall asleep while I'm talking with somebody who gives me so much comfort that I can fall asleep. And I pray. This prayer is very important. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, recognize that this is an unusual time. And when I, uh, I posted a few days ago, when was the time that there was peace reigning, when there was love and respect? Uh, and the first thing that came to my mind, I'm a, I'm a movie buff, was Camelot the time of the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, before that fellowship was broken by man's sinful nature. Camelot is known as a time of peace. When John Kennedy became president, a lot of people said that this was like Camelot. When he became the president, the peace that came, the prosperity that came. Um, this is such a time with the apostles. They all were together. They, they piled all their possessions together. They shared everything equally with everybody. 
Every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They're still in their home church. They're Jewish. They're meeting in the Jewish temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This was a time of, of Camelot, of perfect peace, a restoration of the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the cool of the evening. Can you imagine walking and talking with God face to face, friends, like Katie and I talk together? That to me just blows my mind to think that that's possible. <clears throat> Acts 3 continues um, with, uh, and I don't, can you watch the time for me? Okay, so holler at me at 7.20. Okay, thanks. So uh, Acts 3 begins with Peter healing a lame beggar, and he goes uh, in the morning up to the temple at the time of prayer, and this was about 3 in the afternoon. This, there were three times of daily prayer that they went to the temple, the men went to the temple, and very strict Jewish tradition. Um, the women stayed home and took care of everything, including um, the finances, and the men went to the temple court. They studied, they went, and they sat in the temple in the, the gates of the city, and, and that's what the men did, the men at the temple. So one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, which is about three in the afternoon. So, and at, this was the same time, if you remember when, before Jesus was born, his cousin, John the Baptist, was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Zacharias was a temple priest, and this was the time that he went. He went before the priest, and you know, he had the bells, and he had the rope tied around him, and he went in there, and he, when he came out, he was struck dumb, because he didn't believe the angel, and the angel said, your wife Elizabeth is with child, and he will be John the Baptist. He was like, no, that may happen. She's too old. But it did happen, and he was struck down. But, so this is that same, same temple service at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was there. So his friends brought him or his family, and they set him down at the temple gate. This was the gate called Beautiful. And he was put there to beg every day. He collected the money, and he'd take it home, and they would use that for his support and also for the rest of the family. This was a very common thing in that time. So... He was put to beg every day, and this was a sign of piety to be seen giving to this poor guy. Let me give him some money. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money, but he didn't really look at them. He just said, like, here's his basket. You know, hey, can I have some money? And Peter said something unexpected. He said, look at us. Look at me. So the man gave them his attention. He was surprised. He gave them his attention. He was expecting to get something. He's like, okay, this is going to be really good. Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. And then he said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the man stood up, and his feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. And he went with Peter and John into the temple courts, and he was walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him, they recognized him as the man who was lame that sat by the gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. Now this was prophesied in Isaiah 35, 6, that the lame would walk, the blind would see. This was prophesied. And I just want to point something out. Peter didn't say, I'm here to heal you and raise you up. Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ, this is the name with the power. Even the, even the devils and the demons flee from that name. They recognize that name. Continuing in verse 11, so while the man held on to Peter and John, and all the people were astonished and came running to see, when Peter saw this, he said, why are you surprised? Why do you stare as if it was by our power, our godliness, our righteousness that made this man walk? Because it wasn't me, the God of Abraham. And he's reminding them of their history, their faith history. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. 
You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. If you remember, Pilate had decided to let somebody else go in his stead. He said, so do you want Jesus, or do you want this prisoner, Barabbas, this murderer? And the crowd said, give us Barabbas. So you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you, and you killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are the witnesses of this, and we're called to be witnesses. By faith in the name of Jesus, in the powerful name of Jesus, this man who you see and who you know has been made strong. It is Jesus' name and his faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. And he says, Now, fellow Israelites, I know you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold. From the first word of Genesis, God knew this was coming. And he kept telling people in different ways and through different scenarios and different stories that the Messiah was coming. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. But times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Times of refreshing. Think about the, the, when you've had a great night's sleep or when you wake up from a wonderful nap and you feel strong and refreshed. And your spirit is calm and your body feels great. A time of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised. So until the end times when Christ will come again to gather up his church on earth. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet from among you like me. You must listen to everything he tells you. And of course no one will listen except the disciples. Anyone who does not listen will be completely cut off from your people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And it goes on, and he says, When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you. He sent him first to the Israelites, to the Hebrew people, to the Jewish people, to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And now we know, from history down the road, that the Jewish church turned away from Christ and did not accept him as Messiah and that then the word came from the Jewish people to the Gentiles and then to the rest of the world and that's in fact what Acts is all about. So uh, chapter 4, Peter and John have come before the Sanhedrin and I don't know if you'll remember before Jesus was crucified he was brought before the Sanhedrin and these are the same people. This is Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and they were all there. And they came up to Peter and John while they were speaking, and they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now the group of religious leaders called Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were so upset. This pattern of persecution continues now, and we need to remember that, so that when times get tough, like the Psalms were saying, we can continue our strong witness. So the next day, the rulers and the leaders of the law met, and they had Peter and John brought before them, and they said, By what power do you do this? Whose name? Who told you you could do this? And Peter, get this, in verse 8, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Said to them, Rulers and elders, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness to a lame man, then know this. You and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. And then he quotes from Psalm 118. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, the cornerstone of our current faith today. He says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is the name of Jesus Christ. This is the name by which we are saved today. And so when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized they were uneducated, ordinary fishermen, they were astounded. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And they could see the healed man that was standing there, and there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw, and they conferred together, and they said, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We've got to stop them. They've got too much power. And they said, everyone in Jerusalem knows that they've done this. What are we going to do? And so they said, okay, we're going to let you go this time, but don't do it again. And don't talk about this anymore. Don't tell anybody. 
I felt was really going to happen. Peter said, what is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to God? As for us, we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and heard, what we have done. And after further threats, empty threats, they let them go. And they could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was healed was over 40 years old. It was not like he was a young guy who was going to get better. Verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported on everything that had happened. And all the people that were there raised their voices together in prayer. And they said, Sovereign Lord. And note their response. They raised their voices together in prayer. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And then they quote the prophecy from Psalm 2. And they said in verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. That's a powerful prayer. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. And my prayer for y'all tonight is that you would pray to have this boldness. That when the time comes, you would pray that the Holy Spirit would give you the words to speak. The words that you need to say in that situation and to those people. And that you would speak with boldness about your love for Christ. About his redeeming power, his reckless love, his overwhelming reckless love for them that you would be able to witness, to tell others. In verse 32, and I love this next part, the end of this, and, and chapter 5, just because this just makes me happy. Uh, and you'll see why. <clears throat> I like people that get their just desserts, even though I don't want my just desserts. And that's a whole other story. We'll talk about that another time. Verse 32, all the believers were of one mind and heart. This was a brief moment of heaven and joy and power. No one claimed that any of their possessions was theirs. <clears throat> they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work among them that there were no needy people. Y'all, if we could live like this, there would not be any rioting in the streets. There would be no poor people. If we could, but I mean, we can't. Just they couldn't. They couldn't sustain it. it. It fell apart very quickly, as you'll see. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and, and put it in a pot for everybody. And the money was used as it was needed for the group, anyone who had need. Verse 36, remember this person. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, Remember, Barnabas becomes famous for going with Paul. Barnabas means the son of encouragement. He sold the field he owned, and he brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And this field was apparently worth a great deal of money. And he just gave it all to them. All right. Acts verse, uh, chapter 5. All right. Ananias and Sapphira. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. Now it may be that they saw the attention Barnabas got, and he's like, yeah, I kind of want to do that too. I, I like that. He got a lot of praise and a lot of attention. Um, so with his wife's full knowledge, with his wife's full knowledge, remember that, he kept back part of the money for himself. But he brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. He said, here, I sold, I also sold a piece of property, and I got all this money, and I'm bringing it to you. He didn't give him all the money. And that's not the problem. The problem is he said he gave them all the money. The problem is he lied. Peter, by the power of the Holy Spirit, knew 
He said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? Oh, my word. How has Satan so filled your heart that you would lie to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received? Didn't it belong to you before you sold it? And after it was sold, wasn't it your money to do with as you wanted? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have lied, not just to human beings, but to God. Read verse 5. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. That was it. A great fear seized all who heard what had happened. I mean, wouldn't you? His sin was not that he didn't give it all, but that he said he gave it all, that he lied. It was the lie. And remember, in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, Eve sinned, or, or the, the snake lied to Eve by telling her part truth, part untruth. And then Eve continued that by saying part truth, part untruth. And so it's that combination together. So be very careful what you think and what you say because you're lying not just to your fellow human beings, but to God. Some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. Remember, they didn't have an embalmer at that time, so they couldn't, um, they couldn't preserve the body for any length of time. And no one was interested in mourning him because he had just lied. About three hours later, his wife came in. Now remember, back in verse 2, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money. So here she is in verse 7. She's come in not knowing what happened. And Peter asked her, Hey, is this the price you got for your got you and Ananias got for this land? She says, Yeah, yeah, that, that's it. That's the price. And he said, How can you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the people, the man who buried your husband, are at the door, and they will carry you out also. And with that, she fell down at his feet and died. And the young man came in, and finding her dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And at this time, the holiness of this time, the peace, the perfection, the fellowship with man and God was broken. Man, just we just can't do it. We just can't do it here on earth, no matter how much we try. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So this tells us how we need to be reacting to the things that are happening now. This is God's awesome purity and perfection. In Isaiah, he says, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. In Hebrews 10, 31, it says, It is a dreadful thing, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And think about what the word dread actually means. Verse 12, it says, The apostles healed many. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. They would meet with each other. But nobody else joined them because they were afraid. Even though they were highly regarded by the people, people would stand and watch. Nevertheless, more and more women and men believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And as a result, people brought the sick in the streets and laid them in such a way that Peter's shadow would fall on them as he walked by and they might be healed because Peter's shadow fell on them. Now we know it was not his shadow, but the faith. This is like the woman who, who snuck up on behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment so that she might be healed. It was her faith that healed. Crowds gathered from towns around Jerusalem bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits and all of them were healed. So now the high priest and all his associates who were members of the Sadducees, they were jealous and they were angry and annoyed and they had the apostles arrested and they put them in the public jail. But y'all, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. So they went out and they continued preaching and at daybreak, they began to teach the people. When the high priest and the associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and they sent to jail for the apostles, and the jailers did not find them there. 
So they went back and they reported, the jail is securely locked. The guards are standing at the doors. But when we open the door, there's nobody there. And on hearing this, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. I mean, can you imagine? They're in a locked cell with guards on the outside and there's no way out. Then someone said, hey, you know those guys you put in jail? They're in the temple courts teaching. And they went and they brought the apostles back and they didn't use force because they were afraid of the people, afraid the people would stone them. So the apostles were brought in and they made it to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. What are you doing? You're filling Jerusalem with your teaching. You're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Well, they were guilty. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. And the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and to forgive their sins. And we are witnesses. Again, there are witnesses. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and they wanted to put them to death. But, but, there's always a but, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. He wants to have a private conversation with the Sanhedrin. And he said, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these, these men. And he says, some time ago, an unknown rebel named Thutius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. And then after him, Judas the Galilean, this is not Judas the disciple, Judas the Galilean, appeared in the days of the census, and he led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, his followers scattered, and again, it came to nothing. So then he says, so in the present case, let me advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For their pur if their purpose, if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail, and we don't need to do anything. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men, and you will only find yourself fighting against God. And his speech persuaded them. Y'all, this next part just blows my mind. His speech persuaded them. They're like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. If what they're saying is really from God, then we can't stop it, and it's wonderful because it's God. But if it's man, then, then everything will die out. We don't have to worry about anything. Let's flog them anyway, just in case, just because we can so they called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Remember, this is about the third or fourth time they've said that, and let them go. So the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Many times it says, count it joy when you suffer for God because his kingdom is being advanced. And this is a, that's a hard thing to, to understand. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So here's something that I learned this week. I have found a new Bible podcast that I, I really like. It's called The Bible Recap, if you're interested. So the good news that Jesus is the Messiah the New Testament is sometimes called the good news. It's the gospel. Good news means gospel. But did you know that gospel in the Hebrew is a word associated with royal good news? It's not just, hey, y'all, Katie's getting married. This is the king is coming good news. This is royal good news. This is ruling. This is reigning. This is saying a new king is here. He is reigning. A new king is ruling. So this is what the good news really means. So Jesus is the king and he is here. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know what time we are now, but I'm going to stop anyway. And I want to ask you all to, 
you don't need to be accountable to me because I am really nobody, but I want to ask you all to be accountable to yourselves and to God for, to do two things. I want you to commit to praying daily that God will help you, that God will forgive you, that he will give you the strength you need to be a witness in your life in this moment. I don't mean stand up on the street corner and preach, but that he will give you what you need to be a strong Christian witness. And it may be a, a quiet one. It may be by your actions. And I want to ask you to, to read the word of God for yourselves and to become a stronger Christian, knowing for yourself what it says and not what I'm telling you or what somebody else is telling you, but that you read it for yourself. So before we, will, before we close, if you will, Pray with me quickly, and then, do you have anything? Okay. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, this week has seen violence and turmoil and hatred and, and general ugliness of mankind. And I pray your forgiveness. I pray that you will enter into the hearts of these people that are so angry, that you will give them peace, that you will send somebody to show them your love, to be witnesses of your saving grace, of your relentless pursuit of them, the reckless love you had for them that gave Jesus to die on the cross for their sins and for ours. Send your peace to this world, Lord. Give us healing where we need healing. For those that are grieving, be with them. Give them comfort, Lord, as only you can give. Send your Holy Spirit to be with us, to reign over the earth. Lord Jesus, come quickly because we need you as we never did before. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Be with us now and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we'll see you next time. Bye.